There we go. And we're recording. <laughs> Hello, SPJ New England. I'm John Kersey. I am a professor at Cahaga Community College, which is in the Cleveland, Ohio area. I've been working there for the past 18 years. But long before that, I began my career as a journalist at a daily paper, then went into the business press, and then moved into PR in the 1980s. I worked uh, briefly in the United States Senate as a press secretary, but that's another story for another day. I began researching disinformation about five years ago, focusing primarily on other countries, uh, especially uh, Russia today and the former Soviet Union. But by late 2018, I became quite alarmed at what I was learning about China's disinformation efforts. And if you're curious, you can read and follow along some of what I've done at a website, www.dicampaigns.com, but that's not pertinent to tonight's discussion. I put together a proposal to present on this topic at SPJ's national convention, and that's what's led to tonight's um, session. So I'm grateful to Adam Sano and the officers of the New England chapter uh, for taking a good look at this vital issue. And I'm also grateful to have two important frontline journalists, Mary Way and Eric Wishart speaking with us on this topic tonight. So I'm gonna give a bit of an overview and then I'm gonna turn it over to them. Perhaps the best and fastest way to understand the mindset of the Chinese Communist Party or CCP for short, with respect to media and messages begins with a brief rewind back to around the end of the Cold War. China's leaders at that time noted with alacrity how the West had won and how the former Soviet Union was broken up. And China's leaders then observed intently as President Bill Clinton mobilized global public opinion to end the ethnic war on cleansing in the Balkans, and then how Bush 43 for short did the same thing with Iraq and the global war on terror. By that point in time, the CCP's military and civilian uh, best leaders had decided that they needed a strategy which could counter the United States and the West ability to shape the narrative on a global stage. And China made a couple of key moves here. One was a decision that it would tell its story to the best of its ability to the outside world and try to present a positive and optimistic narrative of what life was like throughout all of China. The second move though was bigger and far more significant. China greatly elevated the importance of media in its strategic planning and thinking. This is most strongly evidenced by a new doctrine that came into play around the beginning of the 21st century. It's called the three warfares. And in this scheme, those three areas are legal, public opinion, and psychological. And from this three warfare strategy, the, the phrase winning without fi firing a shot became a popular way to express it. Tonight, of course, we're going to focus on the second, which is public opinion, and how managing or manipulating the media has become an important part of this. But first, the CCP sees media within China as nothing more than an arm of its party. In document number nine, which was issued in 2013, the year in which the liberals of the CCP were decisively removed from the party, the document explicitly bans the promotion of the West's idea of journalism. So anytime you read or see a story from Xinhua or the China Daily News Group or CGTN, keep in mind that the reporters, the directors, the editors must all follow the party line or risk losing their jobs or even imprisonment. And this is not an exaggeration. Four journalists were published for a minor typographical error in 2015, even though the mistake was corrected within 45 minutes. In the China stock market crash of 2015, and Eric helped me because I'm going to blow this name, okay? Financial journalist Wang Yao Lu was arrested for fabricating news when in reality he was simply reporting facts of what had happened. He was placed on television where he confessed that he should not have published his sensitive reports at such a time, and he begged for leniency to the public. He confessed that his reporting was sensational and irresponsible. And by the way, you can see this confession on YouTube if you look for it. Around 2008, the CCP began to make heavy investments into global media to the tune of about six to seven billion United States dollars as part of its plan to improve its international communications capabilities. In 2018, 
The CCP merged its national TV broadcaster, China Central Television, its national China radio group, and its international service, China Radio International, into the China Media Group. It's also known there as the Voice of China. This group takes orders from the CCP's Central Propaganda Department. The international TV was rebranded into China Global TV Network, or GCTN, with production centers, among others, in Nairobi, Washington, D.C., and London. Xinhua News has 180 bureaus outside of China, with regional headquarters including in New York City, Brussels, Hong Kong, and Cairo. It has a 24-hour English language channel. Two newspapers, China Daily and Global Times, are also under the control of the CCP's propagandist. And this is the same China Daily that has regular inserts in leading newspapers in the United States and the United Kingdom. And let's make no mistake, it is the propaganda department that calls all the shots. For example, video clips showing Xi Jinping's messy hair are never allowed to be on television. Taiwanese flags are cropped out of all video and photographs. A former employee of Xinhua was told to use his press credentials to spy on Dalai Lama when he had a media conference in Canada in 2012. The employer refused and he resigned. The CCP is also ingenious at actually using Western friends and funds to expand and improve its global reach. For example, a loan from the government of Australia and equipment provided by Siemens Austria helped China Radio International go digital in the late 1990s. In 2005, the China Media Center at the University of Westminster in the United Kingdom was founded. Not exactly what you think. This institution holds three-week training courses for Chinese propaganda officials. And believe it or not, these courses are partly funded by British taxpayers through the United Kingdom's foreign ministry. China and the CCP also benefit from its one-way only approach to media dialogue. Since the unrest in Xinjiang and in, uh, further west in mid-2009, all Western social media have been blocked in China. However, all of China's media outlets targeted at foreigners make very active usage of Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and other internet and social media outlets. We know that in 2005, Xinhua News alone established a team of more than 100 people just to manage its presence in Western social media. And that's a minuscule number, by the way. Researchers have proven that overall, China employs millions of people to conduct social media campaigns, many of them aimed at dividing public opinion in the West. We know that in Beijing alone, more than 2 million people work there in the propaganda department. Now, media in the United States and elsewhere have caught on to some aspects of this. For example, Researchers at Stanford University and the University of San Diego concluded that the CCP puts out nearly 450 million fake media, social media posts a year. Now, much to its credit, the New York Times has at times aggressively covered Chinese disinformation campaigns. The media outlet reported on this in August and September in 2019 during the Hong Kong protests when Twitter, Facebook and YouTube removed Chinese social media accounts that were inauthentic and leaked to China, including eliminating 1,000 altogether and suspending 200,000, 200,000 more Twitter accounts. But keep in mind, this is just the number of those who were caught. In one article, China's propaganda guidelines call for it to seek news dominance and information dominance on a path resulting in psychological dominance. To this end, in September of 2011, the Chinese Foreign Ministry began offering press briefings every day, supplanting its old twice a week frequency. And we've seen the Foreign Ministry get more and more active in terms of its media activities. In fact, nowadays it's quite common for ambassadors and members of China's foreign ministry to be warlike just about and attack the activities of foreign nations using hostile language. And what do you know? When that happens, it automatically becomes a very prominent part of the news cycle in Chinese media. 
So as I wrap up, uh, to accomplish its objectives, China's strategists fo and tacticians follow the four pillars of media warfare. And here's how they work. The first one is top-down guidance. They consider media warfare to be consistent with part of a larger national strategy. And it's outlined by senior leaders of the PRC and the Chinese Communist Party. Almost any amount of news, the people reporting it will look to high level people within the CCP for guidance and for timing. The second is the concept of preemption. It's whoever gets there first wins. The first to broadcast or release news on social media gains the advantage by dominating the message and better framing the debate on which then defines the parameters of news coverage it follows. Third, flexibility and responsiveness to changing situations. Operations remain flexible and they will adjust giving different political, military, or in the case of COVID-19, uh, pandemic and medical circumstances. And then four, all available resources. China combines both peacetime and military operations to pursue civilian military integration and local unity to leverage its commercial and civilian assets. And that includes news organizations, broadcasting facilities, and internet users in a comprehensive and a systematic campaign. Now, my final point before we turn to Mary and Eric, and this is key, media in China operates 180 degrees differently than media in the West. Speak the truth and then report it is a highly valued tenet of journalism practice for us. It's number one in the SPJ code of ethics. On the other hand, according to the CCP in China's media, the truth is relatively irrelevant. Their main objective is to present another way of looking at events of the world. And who is the general public, by the way, to judge whether China's way or some other way are better? That's the message that they're trying to get out. And that's the final thought I want to leave with you tonight. CCP's overall strategy is to say that its approach, its philosophy, its very way of life is just as valid as others. For example, how dare the West make any inquiries or complaints about how China treats the Uyghurs in Swingrang province when there's so much racism in the United States? The CCP presents what I'd call a false moral equivalency for what it does, and its media extensively presents its way of seeing the story and then strives to knock down any alternative way at examining the story. Well, tonight we have two... Uh, on the front lines, journalists from Hong Kong that are going to kind of share with from their perspective of what's happening. And uh, their names are Mary Wei and Eric Wishart. So I'm going to introduce Mary first, then we get to Eric a little bit. But Mary is a reporter at Quartz. She's based in Hong Kong, where she covers the intersection of geopolitics, business, and technology. She's also reported extensively on the Hong Kong protest movement and the ongoing crackdown. Prior to joining Quartz, she was a freelance reporter writing for publications such as the New York Times, the Washington uh, Post, and City Lab. So Mary, it's all yours. Uh, thank you very much, John. Oh, and by um, the way, good morning. It's it's um, it's 7.15 Friday morning in Hong Kong. So. Exactly, uh, bright and early. Uh, we just had a big torrential downpour early this morning and now it's switched completely to, to very strong sun. So it's that, that time of year. Um, Yes, thank you very much for that introduction and, all, and also that uh, great broad overview. Um, uh, I can definitely speak to, on the, on the more micro level, having not done quite as much research on, 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 on such a broad um, uh, kind of, uh, view of, of, of Chinese uh, media uh, strategy, but I can, I can speak to how things are changing um, in Hong Kong as uh, Beijing seeks to target um, the media the press um, as a key pillar of civil society through which they can exert greater control um, over Hong Kong as part of, of course, their broader crackdown um, on Hong Kong civil society, um, largely precipitated, of course, by uh, the 2019 protests and, and then the ensuing effort to put that down. Um, but of course, this also fits into the broader picture of um, Beijing wanting to better control and more fully control um, its peripheral regions, Hong Kong being one of them. 
Um, so perhaps I can speak a little bit to how the media has come under a lot of pressure, and I'm sure Eric uh, will have a lot to say about this later on. Um, since 2019 and 2020, uh, July 2020, when the national security law came into place, um, the media really has been uh, under intense pressure and scrutiny from the pre uh, from from uh, the uh, public officials, the government. Um, and I suppose the, the the broadest kind of the direction that it's going in is, of course, the uh, authorities here, Hong Kong authorities in Beijing, we can speak of them as, as, a, as one and the same now, um, really want to make sure that they can, as you say, John, earlier, control the narrative. And how to do this is to make sure that there is much less room in, um, in which uh, journalists and, and publications uh, broadly um, can report um, independently without fear of retribution and, and, and legal uh, problems. Um, and, and one of the biggest ways, and we can kind of go into this more later, is uh, in terms of targeting the media is through talk of fake news um, and accusing the media of bias, of smearing the government, of uh, perhaps even um, advocating well, well, illegal ideas like um, secession, independence, subverting the state. Um, and of course, when the government talks about fake news, it's very unclear who gets to define it. And, and there's been kind of this drumbeat of uh, rhetoric from government officials, the police, saying, you know, certain publications here that are particularly pro democracy are uh, publishing fake news, in their words. And a few weeks later, that you know, is followed up by the police commissioner then ratcheting up the rhetoric by saying, we can now, we will consider prosecuting journalists for publishing fake news, which can be in violation of national security law. So that, I think, so far has been the clearest threat um, uh, from the words of, uh, from the mouth of a, a, a government official of possibly pressing criminal charges against journalists under the national security law basically to doing their jobs. Um, and I'm sure Eric will have a, a, a lot of analysis on, on that and what that means. So that's the, you know, a, a brief example of how the government is targeting uh, uh, journalists in the press and making it much harder to carry out independent research. On the other end, um, or not on the other end, but in addition, they can also just make it much harder to for journalists to do their jobs and they can exert that, that kind of pressure within the existing structures um, the legal structures, the existing laws of Hong Kong, and one example is uh, the uh, is the investigative journalist Bao Choi, who works um, um, for or who had worked for um, the Hong Kong public broadcaster RTHK Radio Television Hong Kong. She was let go. Um, she was working on an investigation into a mob attack um, in Hong Kong against carried out against. Uh, civilians and, and protesters at the suburban train station back in July, July of 2019. And um, it's widely uh, believed, and, and there's reporting to back this up, that um, those attackers were uh, from criminal gangs and that the, there was some degree of collusion or at least you know, willful uh, negligence from, from the police in, um, in not stopping this attack. So uh, this journalist, as a about Choi, as part of a broader team, they were investigating this, and she just a few months ago was charged um, for accessing a public database as part of her reporting, and and um, just a few weeks ago was uh, convicted and, and sentenced for that uh, and fined. So she now has a criminal record for doing something very basic, um, which is going through public records, um, and then she she's still going through the legal process um, of appealing this, but the legal fees rack up. She has lost her um, steady job with <clears throat> the broadcast, excuse me, um, will have to pick up more freelance uh, gigs uh, to supplement income. So in that sense, um, she is still able to continue reporting, but it's been made much harder. And, and so that's another way to exert pressure. And then um, and, and just to speak broadly about the third way, this will be kind of the messaging, uh, how, how Hong Kong uh, uh, the Hong Kong government's messaging has changed a lot. Um, I can speak maybe a little bit more about this uh, later on in the health conversation. I'll just give a broad overview now. Um, is how the, the, the messaging 
and how that's changed, you can see really clearly through um, the government's press releases um, and the way that uh, officials are, are speaking in press, uh, press conferences um, and, and the kind of social media posts that they push out. Um, very much so now, it's all um, reflecting a certain rhetoric that we see and um, associate with uh, the communist, Chinese Communist Party's language. Um, it's very much kind of cut and paste, cookie cutter um, um, reflection of, of, of that type of rhetoric where uh, a lot of ad hominem attacks are made. Uh, really, you do see a lot of kind of relativism, a lot of autism, um, and uh, a lot of um, any kind of criticism of the authorities or um, pushback against the official narrative is immediately dismissed as false, fake news, um, smearing, um, and whatnot. So we can go into that a little bit more, but I thought maybe perhaps I could leave it there for now in terms of the overview of what um, pressure the, the, the media is on them right now in Hong Kong. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. And um, I, I do want to go back to that, but let's let's let Eric uh, get in right now. Eric is a former editor in chief of Agence France Press, member of the global news management responsible for editorial projects there. He also lectures in journalism at both Hong Kong University and Hong Kong Baptist University, where he teaches feature writing and international conflict reporting. Eric has many areas of expertise, including media ethics, challenges of misinformation, the erosion of trust in established media, press freedoms, and the safety of journalists. So Eric, it's all yours. Thanks, John, and um, very interesting, Mary. So, I mean, to follow on from what Mary said, um, the chief executive of Hong Kong, Carrie Lam, who is, is appointed by Beijing to all intents and purposes, um, came out quite recently and she was interviewed in Xinhua News Agent, uh, Xinhua, right? And she said that there are three areas of improvement in Hong Kong. One is the civil service, which means all civil servants now must um, pledge an oath of allegiance to Hong Kong and China, which, in, in, which is basically to the Chinese Communist Party. And let's not forget, if you're a full-time employee of RTHK, which is the public broadcaster, you're officially a civil servant and that covers the journalists. The other one is education. So they're, they're, they're bringing in quite sweeping reforms in education. And uh, the third is the media. And, um, and one big area of this is, is the public broadcaster RTHK, which I think might be the world's oldest public broadcaster. I think it goes way back to like the 1920s, maybe 1928. And um, in um, two or three months ago, they brought in a man called Patrick Lee, uh, career civil servant with no journalistic experience whatsoever as the new director of broadcasting and the nominal editor in chief of RTHK. And um, well, as of now, Carrie Lam says she's very happy with the way he's been performing, which has involved canceling, I think about a dozen programs, a dozen current affair programs that uh, sort of contradicted the, the government narrative and things. And, um, and one thing that was announced quite recently, a couple of weeks ago, is they're going to delete all of their public affairs programming from more than a year ago. Now, RTHK, their archives, their RTHK archives only go back a year. So I find that some programs I appeared on aren't on, on their site anymore, but you could always go on to YouTube or the social media. That is being deleted. And it's no coincidence that two of the most borrowed books in Hong Kong over the past year have been George Orwell's 1984 and Animal Farm, because certainly if you read the first half of, of 1984, so much of ha that is happening here uh, corresponds to 1984, including he who controls the past controls the present. And if you delete all of very rich taxpayer funded, by the way, coverage of, of the umbrella movement, of the Hong Kong protests, then you're in a position to rewrite history. And this is what's been happening with RTHK. Also, and very strangely, RTHK's fantastic reporting and including Bao Choi's uh, investigative report on, on that case that um, Mary was talking about, uh, were entered for press awards in Hong Kong. And Patrick Lee, 
said he wanted all of the entries withdrawn from the press awards, <laughs> including the Human Rights Press Awards, which Mary uh, works on for the Foreign Correspondents Club. We, we do the Human Rights Press Awards with Amnesty International and Hong Kong Journalists Association. So we actually told Patrick Lee, very sorry, but these are individual app entries. They're not RTHK entries. And anyway, it's too late. The judging has, has, um, pro has begun. So she won the HRPA. She won another award, I think, uh, a couple of weeks previously. But I mean, I've never seen this in all my experience of, of, of <laughs> almost 50 years in journalism. I've never seen a media trying to withdraw the work by the journalists from media awards. So you're in this slightly dystopian situation now, RTHK. And I mean, but I think it would be wrong to say that, you know, the journalists have given in. I mean, I listen to RTHK every morning. I'm sure you do too, Mary. I mean, they still stand up. They still do the reporting. They've got a pretty interesting Twitter account, which says pretty strong things. Um, but also at eight o'clock every morning, you get the Chinese national anthem played on RTHK, which so, you know, you always get the reminder of where you are. And I mean, as Mary just said, I mean, you know, the line between the Hong Kong government and the, and the CCP in, in, in Beijing, I mean, that line is gone, I think, particularly since a year ago, since they introduced the national security law. You caught me with my mic muted there. By the way, um, I, I forgot to add, Eric is the vice president of the Foreign Correspondents Club Hong Kong. And that's one of the longest um, organizations of foreign correspondents anywhere. I think it goes back to the 1940s. I think it was in um, Chongqing back then. Mm -hmm. So it, it's, it's been around for nearly 80 years. It's a very revered, very um, hollow journalistic institution. And they were intricately involved with the human rights awards that, that Eric was uh, speaking about. So I think that's pretty good. Hey, before I go back and ask uh, some specific questions about um, life in Airstrip One. Oh, I'm sorry. I meant life in Hong Kong. Um, I, I thought um, I would roll back to what Mary had talked about. Um, I know that you were involved in some research and some reporting on language and certain keywords and how that's changed in the government's uh, official proclamations and official news releases and official statements in the last year or two. Could you elaborate on that a little bit more, Mary? Sure. Um, right. So together with a colleague uh, of mine, uh, Dan Cox, um, at Quartz, who, who since left Quartz, but um, when, when he was at the company, we basically decided to um, embark on this research project and, and to um, analyze 10 years worth of uh, government press releases and just to see what kind of words and phrases um, have changed in terms of the frequency in which they're used um, over the years. Um, and the reason why I decided to do this is because um, basically throughout 2019 and into 2020, as the government um, was responding kind of on a day-to-day -day basis, pushing out all these press releases and press statements about the protests and really pushing out the narrative out there and then into 2020, talking about national security law and how um, this new kind of draconian law is great for the prosperity and stability of Hong Kong, really kind of, um, emphasizing uh, those points and uh, making sure that those ideas are getting out through their official channels. Um, a lot of journalists in Hong Kong uh, and also academics and, and, and um, observers um, had noticed that the rhetoric had really changed uh, from this kind of dry, technocratic, bureaucratic uh, language um, with roots in course, the British colonial era um, and so you often see kind of the old words that you don't really see in like American English uh, would crop up from, uh, from time to time in, in Hong Kong official statements. That had really kind of kind of stopped happening um, and, and, and was replaced by a much more kind of strident um, and, and somewhat ham-fisted way of, of speaking um, that is much more like the uh, Beijing's um, the Communist Party's uh, um, uh, language style. Um, and so we wanted to try and anecdotally, uh, or try and quantify our anecdotal um, observations by looking at um, the rise in certain words and phrases. Um, and and um, we, we charted those. So, so things like, you know, accusing, um, of, well, first of all, projecting state power and saying things like, uh, uh, words like national sovereignty, 
um, endangering national security, Hong Kong being, quote, an inalienable part of Hong Kong. Those phrases um, really spiked up. Um, uh, words like restore stability, social stability, one China, uh, things like that. So, so that was one instance. Another instance was really just pushing back against anyone um, that was um, questioning the, the party line and, and the official uh, um, narrative. And they would really just try and try very hard to deny and refute and condemn anyone um, that dared to, to do that. And you see, in particular, a fa favorite phrase of mine, so-called, um, that's a phrase with which I think um, the Hong Kong official is uh, taking a leaf out of the Beijing playbook now kind of regularly attach to their criticisms um, and takedowns of things and ideas and um, comments that they uh, they don't find very favorable and it's quite a it's quite a lazy approach isn't it because you can call something so called and, and and insinuate that it's not as it is but you're not really adding any substance to that rebuttal um, you're just saying you're just questioning the credibility of something without offering something more credible from your end. Um, and we, we see this uh, done both in, in Cantonese, Mandarin, and, and English. And so just charting the rise of in the use of so-called, you kind of see from, uh, let's see, 2010, it kind of goes down a little bit over the years and it just really shoots up in 2019, 2020. Um, and, and other words like internal affairs of China, external forces like the US um, that are trying to meddle with Hong Kong's affairs, uh, but words like that. Um, and so really um, the idea was to not only follow the actions um, of the authorities, of the police, of, of the government, but really to try and look at their words as a window into their thinking and, and their worldview and how um, they were working on perhaps even a, um, a parallel um, space in which ideas of um, truth and facts no longer held as much, uh, no longer hold as much weight um, as uh, as before. Um, you, you so some of what you talk about remind me of some politicians I've encountered in the past. Um, you you mentioned some words, and I just kind of want to follow up on that. So, for the benefit of those watching and listening, you mentioned um, uh, endangering national security, restoring social stability. One China, uh, so called. Um, are these words that just kind of cropped up and how can I say this frequently in the last couple of years since the 2019 Hong Kong uh, protests? Mm -hmm. Right. So we we yeah, do chart the the rise in the number of these in, in the use of these words from 2010 to 2020, so a period of 10 years. And in the case of so called, for example, it really was not registering on on, on the radar of the press releases in, in the past years. Um, it actually dipped over since 2010 to a, to, to a low and then really just spiked up and rocketed up. Um, and of course, we also had to take into account whether the increase in the, the frequency in which these words were used was just a reflection of more press releases being released uh, as a result of uh, the protests and, and whatnot. And um, we found that actually um, the increase in the phrases in the percentage terms far outstrips the kind of increased frequency in which just the total number of press releases have been, uh, have been uh, published. Um, and so, yeah, so and, and national security, of course, what you'll hear Beijing say is every country has to uphold their national security. The US has it too. Other countries, of course, have national security related laws, but what they leave unsaid, and this is part of the whole so-called um, kind of way of so-called quote unquote way of um, dealing with rebuttals is that they don't mention that perhaps the definition of national security in, in China and Hong Kong is much broader and much more vague where cultural, you, you have this idea of cultural national security or educational national security or media is wrapped under national security is much uh, more all, um, all encompassing um, than the, the tighter, more typical way of national China yeah. that constitutes elsewhere. Mary, kind of implied in what you're describing here was that um, in reaction to, 
in, in a response after, during and after the, 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 the Hong Kong protest of 2019 and beyond, you saw like a rise in the frequency of this official communication and also a concomitant with that a rise in, I think you used the word strident vocabulary, so to speak. So you saw both phenomena happening at the same time? Yeah. Um, um, the police, for example, has um, invested a lot of time and energy into uh, ramping up their social media output and uh, hiring um, um, communications associates and officers to really push out their message through tweets, videos, um, and, and the like. And so you see um, that in addition to really cracking down on the media here in Hong Kong, they are uh, working on building up um, official channels by um, you, by by pushing out. Um, yes, that's a that's a great example that Eric. Explain this, uh, Mary. That. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, do, do, do you want to do you want to describe what we received at the the FCC and this was also sent out to various newsrooms, including New York Times here. Yeah. yeah, sure. I mean, you know, following on from Mary, this is this was published on Press Freedom Day, I think, or set out in Press Freedom Day by the Hong Kong Police, called "No, the facts, rumors, and lies can never be right." You know, and it also feeds into the. The language and um, it gives examples of what it says is fake news. Most, I mean, almost all of it is just these kind of, you know, um, social media rumors. Um, and it talks about um, the myriad fake news served. On, this is talking about over the the protests, basically. It said, in the real world, the police faced much street violence. In the virtual world, the police were vilified in the media and on the internet. The myriad fake news served only one purpose, to injure, this is the kind of language you get, injure Hong Kong by undermining the police, the cornerstone of society. Fake news was maliciously published to slander police officers. So um, thanks, Donald Trump, because you popularized fake news, and we hear it every day now, don't we, Mary, in Hong Kong? I mean, it's just, uh, and from Beijing as well. And it's a bit like so-called, it's a good way of not actually addressing the issue in many, they, they address some of these, these, these things in this, this publication. But if you say so-called or you say fake news, you're kind of disparaging and denigrating without really responding to the, the issue directly. You know, when, I, when Mary was talking, I just did a search and there's a story from the Hong Kong Free Press on May the 11th. Hong Kong leader, which is Carrie Lam, attacks foreign media over coverage of so-called peaceful protests. <laughs> yeah. And Adrian Benz, who's the researcher, who is the kind of bête noire of the Chinese Communist Party because he does all this independent research on the situation in Xinjiang. Uh, I read a story, I, I think it might have been, I don't think it was the Global Times, but a story last week. They actually said, they actually used the phrase so-called three times in the first sentence. He was a so-called researcher, so-called expert on the so-called situation in Xinjiang. I mean, that was, the, I think there was so-called, I, I tweeted it actually, I think somebody counted it up. There were 32 so-calleds in one article, but it's a drumbeat, you know? And, and I mean, it's also a propaganda technique of repeating. I mean, if you read your, you, you know, I don't want to make comparisons from things past, but if you go back to, some of the people who codified propaganda a long time ago, 100 years ago, um, simple phrases and slogans and repeat them, easily remembered slogans. So improvement is a, is a popular one. They've just gutted the whole electoral process in Hong Kong and they call it electoral improvement. You know, and you know, if you say it enough, it will go in it just as the big lie in America, you know, people will believe it. So if you just keep repeating it, I mean, the Chinese Communist Party doesn't have a monopoly in that. I think Trump, through accident or design, is a very effective propagandist by repeating easily remembered slogans. And, um, and, as, and I, I thought, I mean, I recommend everybody reads Mary's article in Quartz. It was fascinating. I mean, you're sort of aware of this, and it's only when <laughs> you actually read it, you think, yeah, this is what's been going on, you know? Yeah. You know, what you said, Eric, reminds me of a quote that is attributed to a guy named Mao Zedong. Um, mm -hmm. I think it goes something like this, a lie repeated 1,000 times becomes the truth. Sure. Um, and Maria but, Ressa, my yeah. dear friend in, in the Philippines, who's looking at a six-year jail, jail term, says that all the time because all of the insults and online accusations against her yeah. have 
ended up with her having about a dozen court cases. And she says that, she quotes that all the time, that a lie repeated a thousand times becomes the truth. Yeah. Mary, the, the per- comes the truth in people's minds, even if it's not actually the truth. Yeah. yeah. Mary, the colleague who um, was was indicted and, and, and made a, uh, a criminal for uh, using public records. Um, obviously, she wouldn't be considered a friend of the Hong Kong government. Um, I, I presume that Winston Smith isn't in the foreign correspondent corps there in, in Hong Kong. So I'm just kind of curious, what does a journalist have to do today in 2021 uh, to be considered a friend, so to speak, of, of China, of the Chinese Communist Party? Yeah, it's. Uh, I am curious to see where that concept and how that concept will kind of take greater shape and hold in Hong Kong. Um, but the concept is uh, yeah, quite developed, I guess, uh, in China, where you often have uh, government officials invoking the names of various uh, friends of China um, who are kind of foreign uh, journalists, academics, um, and other such figures with public uh, with a public presence who um, are friendly to um, uh, the Communist Party and um, are happy to kind of reflect the official narrative without very much pushback or questioning. And um, in recent months, uh, the Chinese Foreign Ministry and their press releases and their statements and, and interviews have, uh, with increasing frequency, um, invoked the names of, uh, of such friends, one uh, the most famous of which is uh, Edgar Snow, the American journalist um, who wrote a groundbreaking book um, about the communist state uh, in the early 20th century and followed up, up with another book uh, later on. Um, and, um, and so I, I, I reported on this, um, um, I guess no figure and how, how his kind of um, role within the, um, in the propaganda machine, I guess, of, of China has changed over the years uh, and, and spoke to various epidemics. So um, it's you know, undeniable that I guess no himself um, did groundbreaking journalistic work and, and um, brought out a story to the world that uh, had not been told by anyone else at that time. And, and they did so in, in difficult circumstances. Um, but in addition to that is um, how he um, really yeah, reflected uh, the, 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 the government line um, and uh, throughout his reporting, he uh, would work very, very closely with um, the CCP to craft and, and, and shape the narrative to their liking. Um, so throughout the course of his interviews, he would uh, provide the transcripts back uh, of his interviews with Mao back to the party who would then Make tweaks, translate it into in, um, or make tweaks, translate it into Chinese, I guess, and then translate it back into English and, and hand it back to to Edgar Snow, who would then use that in in his um, in his book. And so that kind of handholding and um, and um, controlling of the narrative we see a lot still in various different forms and formats um, in in today's um, uh, media landscape. And um, I I can't think of. Um, kind of famous friends of Hong Kong right now, like people who would play that role right now are off the top of my head, but perhaps I wonder if I'm, I'm missing out something at, at 7.30 in the morning, um, Eric. I mean, it's very interesting because, um, I mean, Edgar Snow is this historic friend of China and Wong Yi, who's the foreign minister at the end of the National People's Congress, um, earlier this year, he gave his press conference and he referenced Edgar Snow, but also when he was asked about Xinjiang and, and Western reporting on Xinjiang, he also quoted as a friend of China, a Frenchman called Maxime Vivas, who's an obscure writer, or previously obscure writer, uh, who lives in the south of France, southern France, and who was given uh, official trips to Tibet. He wrote a book basically saying, you know, the, the hidden truth about the Dalai Lama, how everything is going well in Tibet. And he's made two trips to Xinjiang. And he's just written a book about basically, I think it's in French, but basically exposing the fake news about Xinjiang because he says, I've been to Xinjiang twice. I saw nothing. I mean, obviously both organized by the, the CCP. Obviously all's well there too, right? Yeah, but I mean, you can go anywhere, you know. Yeah. I mean, so, um, so he, so CGTN, 
um, published a story on his website about how the only two friends of China that uh, Wang Yi referenced in his speak in his, his, his press conference was Edgar Snow and also this guy, but Maxime Vivas. So I mean, the I find in their in their sort of propaganda, you know, push, they rely a lot on these Western voices, you know. So if if you're a foreigner who goes and does that, you, you're a friend. So. So, I mean, I don't think Maxime Vivas is anywhere. I mean, whatever you think of Edgar Snow's reporting and, and the propaganda work he did for Mao Zedong, I mean, it was a pretty daring expedition to go and see the, 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 the Chinese communists in 37, 38, I think he did it. Yeah. Where, I mean, Maxime Vivas, it was a, you know, it was a, it was a paid and, and um, organized trip. And, but still, I mean, you, you, it still shows that they use this friend of China if you, if you write you know, if you produce journalism that is favorable to the, the Chinese narrative. Yeah. Eric, I wanted to roll back to um, RTHK because as you said, it is, I've been around for nearly a hundred years. Um, could you describe more what's been happening with it in the last year or two and, and how, how can I say this, its management and its editorial focus apparently is gonna be changing or has changed? I mean, yeah, I mean, as I said, I mean, they have this new boss now um, and, you know, you know, journalism is one of the three improvements, which is <laughs> has a kind of a slightly you know, communist or, or 1984 kind of echo to it, but... Um, you mean like two legs, two legs bad, four legs good that way? Yeah, it's that kind of feel, you know, I mean, yeah. it's just so weird. I mean, I know people talk about 1984 a lot and dystopia, but it's quite interesting because if you read it, it kind of... You, you see what's going on here, just and and then suddenly when you read 1984, you think, yeah, this is where we're going, you know. And um, the, I think the the crucial thing for RTHK is, and I mean, you know, you have a public broadcaster like the BBC, which is publicly funded but is editorially independent. In the United States, you have obviously you have um, you know VOA, you have Radio Free Asia. And there's, in, in Radio Free Asia, there's a firewall uh, between the editorial and the management, although Trump with Michael Pack tried to break down that firewall. And I think if Trump had been re-elected, the firewall would have been gone. I mean, they fired Bei Fang as the president of RFA, and then she came back after the election. So, so I mean, you know, it's not just in, in Hong Kong that the, these, these firewalls are fragile, obviously. And, um, you know, public broadcasters financed by public funding always very often displeased governments. The BBC has had constant battles with, with the, the British government. Quite often the British government's not happy about what the BBC does. I mean, that's a natural situation. I mean, I work for AFP. I mean, the 40% of our funding comes directly or indirectly as subsidies or, or for providing services to the French government. And, you know, I was editor in chief, you know, politicians aren't always happy and you bang heads, but there was no way they were ever going to tell us what to do. So, you know, that's a natural combative situation, the problem in RTHK. And, and yeah, I'm sure there's a lot in RTHK that Carrie Lam still doesn't like. At what point is Patrick Lee? And I think, I mean, Mary's probably followed this closer than I have. There's some senior executives have resigned since Patrick Lee came in, this, this bureaucrat. And um, so at what point do you reach a tipping point where they start to change all the news heads and it, it moves from an independent um, public broadcaster where, you know, you still have to have editorial standards to a state broadcaster, which is when you're just pushing out the official government line and the state propaganda. And I mean, I don't know what Mary's analysis is. I mean, would you say Mary were in a period of transition with RTHK? Uh, yes, uh, transition, dismantling and rebuilding up uh, in a very, very different form. And I, I guess um, this is also happening, um, not just at the public broadcaster, uh, but also at private um, uh, cable TV channels uh, where a new management has been helicoptered in, um, essentially parachuted in. Um, and changed, and, and you see... Uh, Parachuted in from the mainland China? Uh, uh, not, I don't think so, not, um, not directly. Uh, I forget exactly the details, uh, but um, just um, 
uh, accepted to um, would be more than willing and, uh, and happier to kind of toe that line and, and not push, uh, you know, sensitive reporting um, at, as um, as eagerly. Um, and, and that has kind of led to uh, at one channel called Cable Cable TV News. Um, that has led to the entire China reporting team um, resigning. Um, and, and moving over to um, a, uh, an independent um, online news site where uh, called Citizen News, where they now do their own um, Chinese, uh, Ch uh, China focused reporting um, uh, a program. Um, so you see this kind of, I suppose what we're watching now is um, also this kind of uh, cultivation of a friend of China, um, which I think maybe in past years, because of how kind of um, freewheeling and, and independent. Um, the Hong Kong media scene was there really maybe perhaps wasn't very much room um, or yeah very much room for this cultivation of such a figure like that Snow. but um, it seems like with kind of this uh, these changes at RTHK and, and also other um, uh, cable TV channels um, that you will see perhaps you know journalists who want to get promoted up the ranks um, it within those organizations will more and more have to conform to a certain type of, of uh, as a journalist figure in order to move ahead uh, in their careers. There's two things that, that um, alarm me a little bit from what you're saying, Mary, and what, what you're saying, Eric. And the first one was, if I heard correctly, some of the um, RTHK reporters and um, videographers who had won some human rights awards, they've resigned. Is that correct? Because they, they wanted to pull the awards, but it was too late because you were judging it. And then the well, winners actually... It wasn't there, um, Mary, who resigned. But, I mean, they just fired... Uh, I mean, they essentially fired... Um, the Bellicosa. A reporter who was asking these aggressive questions, right? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, there was, a, there was a, one of the journalists um, who was on a temporary contract, right? Um, and kind of quite aggressively, you know, like all journalists to question Carrie Lam at a press conference, displeased the powers that be, got her uh, contract, a probation period, right, renewed, yeah. and then wasn't extended, so she lost her job, you know, and that was just talking truth to power, the, you know, she got in trouble and she was, she was fired, you know, so. How, uh, what a coincidence, huh? <laughs> yeah. The other thing that I heard, and I wanted to make sure I caught this correctly, Eric, they're deleting past programs, something, anything more than a year old, you said, from the curation and the website and other places where it might be appearing, like on YouTube? Yep. yep. They're taking down stories. Yes. Mary, I mean, how it's, um, yeah, this came out, I think this came out in Press Freedom Day as well, you know, and, um, and they've, they've begun the process. Yes. Um, wow. you know, it was some kind of line about we're going to pull, you know, because we only, <laughs> it was slightly, you know, because we only keep our archives on the RTHK site, and we're, we're bringing the social media sites into line, you know. So yeah. all the troublesome coverage, all the interviews with the Jimmy Lies or the pro-democracy figures is just being expunged. And I think this really also illustrates the danger of relying on uh, places like YouTube as, as archives and everybody was there was this whole movement to to try and download and preserve these programs by kind of independent voices in Hong Kong to, to, to save this archive. Yeah and if they needed to I probably would imagine they would say this is done to um, what was that word Mary restore social stability. I think that was one of the phrases you noticed that were being used a lot. Hey there was a question in the in the chat I wanted to, to post to both of you and then I have a question for you too Eric. Are Chinese media uh, outlets recruiting uh, British American journalists and if so why and, and, and is how, how dangerous is that? I mean the, you know the, the Chinese media have always um, used Western media. I mean, that's not a Western journalists. I mean, that's not, a, it's not unusual. I've got a colleague who's a former editor in chief of Reuters who has done um, consultation work for CGTN. So, I mean, that in itself, I mean, dangerous is a big word. I mean, I mean, it depends who you work for. Is it any more dangerous than working for Fox News, peddling um, anti-vax uh, propaganda and, and the big lie about the, um, about the uh, American election. So, I mean, as I say, I mean, 
I think you just have to be aware if you're working for an outlet like that, who you're working for. And quite recently for a book project I've been working on about fake news and propaganda, I interviewed a man called Peter Humphrey. He was a Reuters journalist who worked in uh, Shanghai with his wife. He had a business doing sort of investigations, you know, corporate investigations and was arrested. I think he investigated the wrong person. They both got two years in jail. He was the first foreigner to do a public uh, televised confession, right? Uh, he's back in, he, they were released, he's back in England now, and he's a vocal uh, opponent of CGTN. And he said that um, when he did his forced confession, he was led in an orange vest, handcuffed and put in a steel chair inside a cage. And the confession was filmed by a crew from CCTV, which is the, which is the umbrella of CGTN. So, um, and so he has been campaigning, he campaigned quite successfully in Britain to have CGTN's um, license revoked on the basis that it was broadcasting these false confessions and it was part of the Chinese propaganda um, apparatus. Um, the, the, I think the, the French allowed it to continue broadcasting. So he's also, I think, trying to get it, stop it being broadcast in, in the United States. So, I mean, you know, it's up to every journalist to decide who he wants to work for. You know, if somebody's sympathetic to China and they want to work for Chinese state media, that's, that's their decision, you know. But I mean, I think they just have to be aware of who they're working for, just as if, if you work for Fox News, you have to be aware of Tucker Carlson and Sean Hannity. So you, you make that decision. You know. I don't know. Somehow you're describing something that, that seems to go a little bit further than what I call the media bias. And, you know, I, I, when I talk to my students in my in my intro classes, you know, I will do this right now. Right. You know, there are some media in the United States that kind of lean this way. <laughs> and there's some media in the United States that kind of lean that way. You're, you're not talking about leaning. You're talking about something a lot more serious than that, I think. It was quite interesting because um, we wrote to the Hong Kong police commissioner about, the FCC wrote to the Hong Kong police commissioner, Chris Tang, who's been very vocal about fake news, who said that anybody publishing fake news that could harm national security will be investigated and prosecuted. So we wrote back and said, well, what does this mean? There is no fake news, there's no legal definition in Hong Kong of fake news, there's no legislation about fake news. Fake news legislation universally has been used to suppress press freedom. And the PR department of the police wrote back and said, yeah, well, journalists have to respect the law like everybody else. And lumped in violent protests with fake news and biased media reporting that can trouble public harmony or social harmony or whatever. So it's very interesting. I mean, they're, they're, they're associating not only sort of online falsehoods with, with the, the protests, they're also including biased media coverage, which is again, you know, anything that doesn't fit Carrie Lam's vision of an improved media environment in Hong Kong. So yeah. sure. If it if it doesn't match the narrative the government wants, there's a problem with it. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Eric, um, what press freedoms do we in the West take for granted that aren't taken for granted in Hong Kong anymore? And and how much influence does Chinese propaganda and media controls have today in terms of the day to day on the ground coverage of what what you're seeing in Hong Kong? And last but not least, because I know you've, you've examined different systems, could you do a little compare and contrast of what you're seeing right now in China with what we've seen in, in terms of uh, Russia and Russia's effort to um, produce disinformation and to squash the practice of journalism? I mean, I was speaking to a friend yesterday um, who worked in Russia a long time ago who met Putin, he's a journalist, and he said there are a lot of parallels with what's happening in Hong Kong. I mean, I mean, you know, the two communist parties, you know, I mean, the, the Bolsheviks were in Shanghai in, in around 1919, 1920. I mean, the civil war was still going on in, in Russia, and they were already in Shanghai working with the Chinese communists. Uh, and so they were very instrumental in the, in, in the early days of the Chinese communist party. So that the two have worked together, and I mean, the, to me, the masters of propaganda and disinformation from the start were the Russians, and I think the Chinese have, have learned a lot from them. Um, 
I think the way the propaganda works is a bit different. I think the Russian approach is more just to create division and chaos in the West to divide alliances, where I think with the Chinese, it's more to, I think they generally want, they want to use it to attack critical coverage, but they also want to use it to improve their image, you know. Um, but I mean, freedoms, I mean, you know, it's what freedoms, one of these things. And I mean, I think I'd love to hear what Mary has to say about this because she, she has to do the on, on the ground reporting. But I mean, suddenly when you've got a national security law and you have a police chief saying that if you publish fake news, we're going to criminally investigate you. I mean, that's a pretty chilling effect. Then you're looking over your shoulder. And I mean, this sounds a bit funny, but I mean, they talk about red lines in Hong Kong, but I mean, the paint is fresh in these red lines. It would be easy in Beijing because in mainland China, you know where the red lines are. And, and I think the very unusual thing, and it's, it's interesting and uh, on one hand to observe and also quite disturbing to observe, is to see a society in transition like this from a year ago, you could say something without any problem. And now you're asking yourself, if I say this, am I going to run foul of the law? And I mean, probably most all journalists in Hong Kong in one shape or the other could they could say you you, you did something that transgressed that law I mean it's so open for um, interpretation and I, mean, I think the other thing is sourcing as well and I mean Mary probably finds that too I mean people don't want to talk on the record or maybe off the record anymore you know it's had a really chilling effect on on sourcing yeah, yeah chilling to a deep freeze no doubt yeah um, yeah yeah, yeah. People are going to walk around carrying that booklet, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Any more thoughts about comparing Ch China and Russia? Because I, I mean, from my, from my, from what I researched, I think you're exactly right. Uh, China's, uh, Russia is more in terms of divisive and trying to pit one group against another, where China seems to have more of a multifaceted strategy. Um, one is to um, demonstrate, if not superior, at least equal to an equivalency of in terms of how its approach is and what it does. And then the second is, is always to, um, how can I say this, to ruthlessly put down enemies. I mean, I was stunned when I saw some of the language that the social media people, uh, again, coming from mainland China, were using, uh, describing the Hong Kong protesters as cockroaches and evil people and some other things back from the 28, 2019 period. Do uh, you have any well, thoughts, thoughts on that? that? We wrote, a, the FCC sent a message, published a statement ish, uh, expressing its concern about the, the prosecution of the reporter, Boy Choi, uh, who, who accessed these, this public database. Uh, she was trying to find out, identify um, these vehicles that delivered weapons to these thugs that beat up protesters. Yeah. Eric, if uh, you don't mind, let me interject for a second, because I think any Western journalist will get this right. Those public records was nothing more than a database of what is it, driver's licenses or license plates, right? Yeah. That that yeah. almost any journalist in any 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 investigative journalist in the United States would know how to access something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, go ahead. I'm, I didn't mean to interrupt. I thought it was important. There was like three boxes you could take the reason you were looking for it, and um, they took away the box that said it, other reasons. Or so she ticked a box said transport. And, I think transportation or transport reasons, you know, it was kind of, it was about the most appropriate box. And she, um, she, she I mean, she was prosecuted for that and fined the equivalent of about eight or 900 US. And um, so we issued a statement and got slapped down by the Chinese foreign ministry because basically they were accusing us of saying that journalists are above the law because the argument for them is she broke the law. I mean, in, in, in our position as well, you know, it's an interpretation of the law and she pled not guilty, she was found guilty and she's appealing it. And I think in a, in a democratic society, you're allowed to express an opinion on a judgment. And so the Global Times, which is owned by the People's Daily, came out and said, Office of the Commissioner of the Chinese Foreign Ministry in Hong Kong strongly condemns FCC and other, and other foreign forces. So they accused, they called us foreign forces for pointing fingers at the case, pointing fingers, that's another one for your book, <laughs> Mary, pointing fingers at the case of journalist Boy Choi. And we are not a foreign force. We have been in Hong Kong as long as communist, you know, the, the, the People's Republic of China has existed. We've been in Hong Kong since 1949, you know. Yeah. 
And I said the spokesperson of the office of the commissioner of the Chinese foreign minister in Hong Kong on Friday strongly condemned the Foreign Correspondents Club Hong Kong and other, other foreign forces for pointing fingers at the verdict of journalist Boy Choi, saying that no organization or individual shall meddle with Hong Kong affairs, which are China's internal affairs in the pretext of press freedom. So it's pretty, I mean, that's pretty serious coming from the Chinese foreign ministry. And I think it also shows how they've ramped up the rhetoric. I mean, it was a pretty standard statement that we issued, you know, which is the FCC's role, you know, and that was a pretty big stick that came back and hit us in the head. So, so, um, and then talk of external forces, um, that's that you're getting into kind of dangerous territory. You know. That's a warning shot, basically. No. Yeah. We're kind of used to it though, and we know them, and you know, we met the foreign ministry last year, they know who we are, but I mean, you know, some people said, well, that's just the game you play, but no, I mean, it's, there's, there's a toughening of the rhetoric. I mean, it yeah. wasn't there before. Well, when you, find, when you find a journalist guilty of a crime that isn't really a crime, and then, and then you, you, you go after the people who try to support that journalist by, by this technique, I mean, that's, that's strong arm, that's, that's intimidation by, by, by the way I would look at it. So, well, unless um, there's anything else from, um, from the chat or anything else, I think we've been on for about an hour and it's been very enlightening. I want to thank you, Eric. Mary, I want to thank you. Uh, Mary, it was great to meet you. <laughs> I've been reading your, 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 your stories and it's good to meet you in person. This is the first time she and I have chatted. Eric and I have gone back, I don't know, four or five months now and really benefited from his expertise and his knowledge. So um, I think this is the end of the session. And I believe that uh, SPJ New England will um, let everybody know how to access this. And um, by the way, if you don't know Mary, I think Eric does. The person who did this before for SPJ New England, I think was some guy named Don Lemon of CNN. So. Um, we, we had some pretty big shoes to follow. Yeah. So, uh, so uh, I want to thank um, both of you and uh, I want to thank SPJ New England for, for hosting this extremely important thing. And, you know, if you don't mind, I just want to conclude with a, a plea to everybody. Pay attention to what's going on with China and the media. China is one of the most powerful media entities in the world right now. And what they're doing in Hong Kong, to a lesser extent, they're doing the media all over the world in many, 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 many countries. They don't have the territory like they do Hong Kong, but some of the strategy and tactics that they're doing are the very same. And it's, it's really incumbent, in my opinion, for anybody who loves freedom of the press to pay close attention to this and, and start um, arming up and defending against this, these types of strategies and tactics. All right. Thank you all very much. Have a good evening. Stay strong and stay safe. <laughs> Thanks.